Father, we thank you that you indeed have rescued us and invited us to your table. We pray for a sweet time of fellowship this morning as we study your word. Just pray that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would uh, massage hearts. It's uh, some difficult things to talk about, and we just pray uh, that you would uh, provide comfort and, and healing, uh, help us to learn to make better decisions as we go through this journey together. Help us to learn what you want us to learn about you and about ourselves from this passage of Scripture. We'll give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We entitled this series, You Have Questions, the Bible Has Answers. And I had um, actually planned to jump over to start the life of uh, Joseph because there's, there's so much about Joseph that aligns with the subtitle that we're looking for Jesus in type and in action in Genesis. And the story of Joseph is just full of things that give you pictures of the type of Jesus. And as I was preparing that message, about three people came to me with questions about the section I was going to skip over. So, <laughs> being convicted by my own sermon title, uh, we're going to get into some uh, touchy areas today. Pray right. with us. Please, I uh, titled this message, and you thought your family was messed up. <clears throat> you know, there's always a lot of confusion when you read the Old Testament. People get uh, confused because they read about what the people of God did and make the assumption that God approved it. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, God shows us what his people did. Matter of fact, if you weren't convinced that the Bible was authored by the Holy Spirit, it's these kind of stories that should change your mind. People trying to make themselves look good would never write the things that you see in this book. All right. uh, we still wouldn't know about David's sin had not the Holy Spirit forced the story to come to light. We would not know this section we're about to read unless the Holy Spirit wanted it to come to light so that we would be not impressed with the people who say they know God, but the God of amazing grace who forgives sinners all the time. Amen. I hastened through the end of Genesis chapter 33 last week. I, I mentioned about Jacob and his not really disclosing to his brother after the reconciliation that he really wasn't going to go with him to, to see her. I put a, uh, a map on your, your handout today. If you would just take a moment to locate some of the names of places we've been mentioning without actually showing you on a map where they, where they stand. So you, you see Edom near the bottom center of the map, and in very tiny print you see Mount Seir right above there. So after their meeting, Esau's going to go south back to uh, the land he had settled in. And Jacob, who said, you go on ahead. I got my wife and kids and little people. I'll catch up with you. You'll notice he goes north. And then he goes west. He's going nowhere near where he kind of let his brother think he was going to accompany him. OK? You also locate on the map to the left uh, Shechem and Bethel, which will be significant in the passages that we see today. You see that he had to cross the Jordan River to get to that territory. You'll notice the middle section there in Israel is uh, mountainous and then a valley in between. Naturally, you want access, you want control of that valley. Who wants to have to climb mountains when they can go through a valley. So all of these other nations that you see invading Israel, everybody wants access to that Jordan Valley to get down through there and head over to Egypt or get up through there and head off to Europe, Asia, those kind of things. So it's always going to be a land that people want to control, a very significant trade route. Okay? And off to the right, you see the Arabian Desert. So again, just wanted you to get a, a, a graphic of where some of these places are. So first point, Jacob, Israel, received forgiveness from his brother Esau, but chose not to journey with him when they reconciled. And that was actually a good decision, but he, he could have been and he should have been more honest about it. 
And we do it all the time, don't we? We don't really want to tell people why we don't want to hang with them. <laughs> so we come up with these excuses. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to catch you. I'll call you. I might get there. And you know good and well, you have no intention of showing up. So can we practice our honesty a little? You know what? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't be there. I, I have something else I need to do. That, that'll work. Okay? I don't know who needed that. <laughs> so Jacob went in the opposite direction of his brother Esau, but he actually stopped short of where he was supposed to go. He's going to stop in Shechem. But we'll see as we read through the story and, and, and notice that he, 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 there's other places he was supposed to be going, one of which was Bethel. I mean, he's on the way back to his homeland to be with his father, to be with his other people, but for some reason he stopped short, settled down somewhere where he really should not have. That's going to lead to some problems. Doesn't it always? So the point of application is why do we always so often, I should say, stop short of where God wants us to go? So we, we made the good decision, okay, I'm, I'm not going to run with the people who I used to get in trouble with. That's good. But then why are we stopping short of going all the way to where God wants us to go? Yes. See, it's not just enough to be going in the right direction. Go all the way to where God wants you to be. We love to straddle the fence. Uh -oh. One foot in the world and one foot out. And you know my illustration, when you're straddling the fence and you slip, men, that hurts. Amen. Okay? So let's come all the way out of the world and walk in the spirit and stop straddling the fence. Some of y'all are just starting to get that. <laughs> At the end of chapter 33, verse 18, the word of God says, Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem in the land of Canaan, the promised land. When he came from Paddan Aram, he pitched his tent before the city. He bought a parcel of land which, where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. And he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel, the God, the God of Israel. Nothing wrong with building an altar to sacrifice to the Lord. They did that often. Nothing wrong with the name to which he dedicated it to. It is good to know that he is worshiping the God, the God of Israel. But again, he's still not to the place where God wanted him to be. Jacob pitched on the back of his out your outline. Jacob pitched his tent near a city of the Philistines. Bought land instead of reclaiming what God had already promised that he was going to give to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Poor decisions can have major consequences. And we see no record of Jacob consulting God before making these moves. Again, so typical of so many of us believers. We do what looks right, what looks good, what seems convenient, and we don't consult God first. We do it, and then we pray and expect God to bless it. Okay. So he's landed in Shechem. He's bought land from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father. These names are about to become very significant as we go into chapter 34. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Remember, Jacob at this time has 11 sons by four different women and one daughter from Leah. So now they're in this land, right? Verse 2. When Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the country, saw her, he took her, he lay with her, 
He violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the the young woman. Let, let, Let me pause there for a second. Jacob is going to do a horrible job of parenting at this point. I'm also going to talk about something that is still an epidemic in our society today, where men and women continue to confuse lust with love. And those results are usually tragic. The, the language, there's three times in that verse 2 that really emphasize the, the horrible actions of this young man. He has lusted after this woman and he has physically taken advantage of her. He, he sexually assaulted her. He has violated her. And then the next thing is talks about now he's, he's got this soul, t- he's, his lust is just, now he thinks he's in love. Now he speaks kindly. Now he wants to marry her. I ain't buying that. Right, right, right. <laughs> he goes to his father in verse 4 and says, get me this young woman as a wife. Why didn't he have that kind of conversation with her before he took advantage of her? Dad, would you now arrange this marriage for me with this woman that I have already violated? Look at letter A in section two. Shechem's forced himself upon Diane and now he decides he wants to marry her. The Lord has consistently said that sexual activity outside of marriage by force or mutual consent merits a death penalty. Now, America doesn't want to hear that. But as you read scripture from cover to cover and see the moral standards of God, the Bible is clear. Any sexual activity that is not from a man and a woman born that way in holy wedlock. Don't you expect something about he he locked and loaded or he I mean don't you just expect something else to happen after I heard that this dude violated my only daughter. So you're just like on pin, so what's he going to do? You don't see one word of him doing anything. The next sentence says, now his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent. Jacob held his peace until his sons came home. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. Doesn't this beg the question, why didn't we see that language from Jacob? They're going to come and discuss a marriage contract, father to father, and the son who wants father to arrange the marriage, and there's no conversation about the violation. See, if, if you're Jacob, you, you would expect thoughts to be going through your head like, Should I let his body stay on his shoulders attached or should one be in one room and the rest? You violated my daughter and now you just want to walk in here like nothing happened and talk about a wedding? (laughs) 
See, her brothers are ready to throw down. And dad isn't handling this well at all. Verse 8. Hamar spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. And make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. Take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall live with us, verse 10. The land shall be before you. Live and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Verse 11, Shechem said to her father, And her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much as a bride price, as a dowry and gift. I'll give you according to what you say to me, but give me this young woman as a wife. Let's arrange some, not just this one marriage, how about we arrange that other daughters of the Israelites, your people, your entourage, marry with some of our children, and let's just live together and work together and intermarry, and let's just work it out. Nobody's talked about the violation. Jacob should have been saying, you know what, before we say anything, first of all, you should be thankful that blood isn't running already, but... Where's my baby? I want to talk to my daughter. You and my marriage, she may never want to see this dude again. I want to talk to her. I want to see how she... You'll notice later that she's still in their household. She's still, if you will, a prisoner. While the fathers are arranging marriages. That's how you know the the Holy Spirit is showing you even people who should know better often don't do what they should be doing. This this is a book about the grace of God, not the perfect behavior of the people who say they know him. It's a whole bunch of folk going to mess up in Genesis 34. Look at, look at letter C. Section 2, letter C. Don't, don't miss this. The right actions taken at the right time, things such as repentance, things such as apologies, things such as forgiveness, would have saved many lives. Is the Lord speaking to you about doing something differently? Yeah, we're, we're talking about a messed up family, and, and all of us have some mess going on in our families. But maybe right now there's something you could say or do that might stop some further pain in your household. They're arranging marriage contracts. Verse 13. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father, And spoke deceitfully because she had, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. They're about to speak deceitfully. Wonder where they got that from. (laughs) What's the saying? Apple don't far fall fall far from the tree. (laughs) First thing they start to do is deceit. They're gonna run game, if you will, on Shechem, Hamor and the rest of their people. Verse 14, they said to them, we, we can't do this thing. Give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. That, that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we'll consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you. We'll take your daughters to us. We'll dwell with you. We will become one people. But, verse 17, if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. In their words, please Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. So the young man did not delay to do this thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. 
He was more honorable than all the household of his father. That's not saying a whole lot right there, is it? That's not a tribe of folk I want to be intermarrying with if, if this rapist is uh, one of the most honorable in the group. Hamor and Shechem, verse 20, his son, came to the gate of their city, spoke with the men of the city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives. Let us give them our, our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us to be one people. If every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and we will live with them. And all who went out of the gate of the city heeded Hamor and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. So Dinah's brother said, okay, you know what? Before we talk marriage, you guys have to get circumcised like we are. Otherwise, no deal. Circumcision, as you well know, was a, a holy covenant between God and his people to remind them that they were in relationship with him. As I often say a couple times a day, normally every Jewish male would be reminded that I am, my manhood is to be under the lordship of my God and creator. A very visible sign. He didn't have them put a tattoo on their back. He had them circumcised, so they have to notice. <laughs> But why tell these guys to be circumcised and you haven't mentioned one word about worshiping the God who told us to get circumcised? They're just being deceitful. And then when Shechem and Hamor go back and start talking about the value of this marital contract and all we need to do is get circumcised and oh, by the way, their property will be our property and that's not in the agreement. So they're being deceitful. Dinah's brothers are being deceitful, but they must have been very convincing because they convinced all these grown men to get circumcised. <laughs> Fellas, can I keep it real for a minute? Keep it real. Keep it real. Considering the lack of modern technology and painkillers and all, I mean, there's a reason why they do this to babies before they leave the hospital. See, I'm grown now. You, yeah. And now you're telling me that I should go through this so we can... And yet they all did it. Let's look at letter D. Jacob's sons and Dinah's brothers, Simeon and Levi, used a sacred religious ceremony, circumcision, to weaken men for the slaughter. Do not assume this was approved by God just because it's recorded in Scripture. Look at verse 25. Came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took a sword, came boldly upon the city, and killed all the men. They killed Hamor. They killed Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword. And they took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. Remember I said earlier, all this time, they still have that poor girl captive, and they're sitting at the table discussing marriage contracts. This is Jacob. This is the man called Israel. This is the man that's had face-to-face -face encounters with God. He still isn't doing everything right. And as you sit and look at me with your saved selves, you know you still aren't doing everything right either. We all need to thank God for his amazing yes. grace. Yes. 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 Mm. Verse 27, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain, plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, their donkeys, what was in the city, what was in the field, and all their wealth. All their little ones and their wives they took captive. They plundered even all that was in 
the houses. Their sister was violated. Daddy did nothing. They are outraged, but you notice that they kind of went over the top. They're wiping out everybody and taking everything. And these are the sons of Jacob. You have to know that God doesn't approve of this stuff. He recorded it to show you that he is a God who can forgive the most outrageous sin and sinners. Don't you see how things could have turned out differently if Jacob had done the right thing, if there'd been some confession, if there'd been some repentance, if there'd been some conversation with his daughter, but none of that happened, and now a whole city is plundered. Men are killed. They didn't participate. You see how sin affects communities? Yes, it does. The, the, the saying, no man is an island. The, the whole community was defiled. Now a whole community is being wiped out. Please don't think that your sin just affects you. Ooh. And the person you might have sinned with. There's always consequences, ripple effects that go on and on until things get handled biblically. Wow. Now Jacob speaks up for the first time in chapter 34. Look at verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. For since I am few in number, they'll gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. If they said, he ain't going to treat our sister like a harlot. Right. Jacob is worried about his reputation and, uh -huh. and, and what's going to happen. Where was the concern and compassion about your baby girl? Why is this the first time he's saying something? Right, right. How are they going to look at me because of what you guys did? I hadn't put two and two together before, but, but later on, when, remember when we get to Joseph, and, and Joseph is kidnapped, and, but Jacob won't think he's dead. He is, you can't console him. He's wailing, he's crying, oh, my son has been taken. He was beside himself because he thought his son had been taken and killed, but you don't see him ready to fight for baby girl. You see how it takes the grace of God to get men and women to view each other the way God wants us to view everybody? Jacob struggled with loving his whole family equally. A lot of men in the Old Testament struggled with loving their daughters as much as they loved their sons. And some of us, as flippantly as we say we love everybody, All right. still have our special few that we actually love, and the rest we just tolerate. Yes, sir. He's outraged when something happens to Joseph. He's very passive when something happened to his daughter. But her brothers weren't having it. But they went to an extreme. See, when, when the Bible said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, do you realize that God was trying to balance us? Because when we get revenge, we, okay, you, you hurt my daughter's eye, I'm hurting both your eyes and all your front teeth. No, he said an eye. For an eye. My act of justice is not supposed to be the same kind of violation as the first perpetrator. Because we're all out of control. That's why God has to give us these laws. Okay? Look at the last thing on letter E, section 2 there. As Jacob's concerned more about his reputation and status in the community than he was about his daughter being violated, what concerns you the most? 
your character or your reputation. We work hard to make people think we're all that. We all want a good reputation, but as the old preacher said, you take care of your character. Let God take care of your reputation. Most people are more concerned about what people think they are than who they really are when they're alone with the Lord. Okay? Chapter 35. The Lord wanted Jacob to return to Bethel and make an altar to the God who was always there for him through his trials. Do you need to rebuild your place of worship and remembrance? Chapter 35, verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves. Change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, the earrings which were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem, and they journeyed, verse 5, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Remember Jacob's worried about what's going to happen to him? Notice how God had his back. He put the fear of God in the people that Jacob thought were going to harass him. Verse 6, Jacob comes to Luz, Bethel, in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, God of the house of God, because their God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Practical Practical sanctification involves constantly making the choices that honor the Lord and turning away from idolatry. The house of God and idolatry do not go together. Remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 where where Paul was talking about the faith of the church in Thessalonica and he said your your reputation is is going out. People are hearing about you, about your genuine faith. And then he said you have turned from idols to serve the living God. See, it's not just enough to turn away from idolatry if you don't go all the way to worship. It's not enough to stop doing something and not start doing the right thing. That's why the Bible always says, put off. And then he names some of the sinful practices and he says, put on the things that the Holy Spirit wants you to do. So you turn from idols to turn to the living God. The question is, why was there so many idols in the household and entourage of Jacob? Perhaps they took a lot of them when they plundered the city in chapter 34. But the problem is they should have known better. These are people who are following a man who knows the Lord, and suddenly there's all these idols that he has to tell them to get rid of. Why do we love to hold on to our idols? We say we love the Lord, we say we worship him only, but yet we still choose to hold on to stuff that can't do us any good. Worshiping God and worshiping celebrities and entertainers and material possessions, they're idols. Let them go. Can't help you. Let, let, Let me move on here. Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, is going to die, and she's going to be buried there in verse 8. And then God appears to Jacob again in verse 9. When he came from Paddan and blessed him, and said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. He called his name Israel. God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you. Kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. You and your descendants after you, I give this land. 
Then God went up from him to the place where he talked with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone. He poured a drink offering on it. He poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel, house of God. Over and over, God appears to him. God reminds him of the promises. God protects him. God is showing himself faithful and gracious and merciful to a man who doesn't always get it right. That should encourage all of us because he's faithful even when we're not. He keeps his promises even when we don't. He doesn't stop loving us because our behavior isn't what it should be. He's reminding us over and over again, I got you, I got your back. Let's change the behavior. Let's do it right. Don't you get tired of the consequences after a while? God's going to let it hurt to get you back in line. If sin didn't have some consequences, most of us would keep doing it. Amen, lights. Amen. God appeared to Jacob again, reminded him of his destiny, his change of name, his change of character, and all that the Lord had promised him. And the proper response to God's gracious provision should always be worship, should always be thanksgiving. The chapter closes with these thoughts. His beloved Rachel was going to go into labor and give birth to the 12th son that daddy was going to name Benjamin. She named him Benoni, son of sorrow. She's going to die in childbirth, having that last baby. Isn't it interesting that earlier on, when this whole baby contest started, and, and Leah's having babies, and Leah's maid servants having babies with Jacob, and Rachel's maids are having babies with Jacob, everybody but her. And she said those words, give me babies or I die. And Jacob said, I'm not God, I can't make it happen. Isn't it sadly interesting that the one who said, give me babies or I die, died having a baby. We need to say, Lord, I just want what you want for me. I think I know what I want, but at the end of the day, I want to be satisfied with what you want for me. I know what I want. I don't know what's best. I know what I want, but I don't know what would bring you glory and do me good. So let's not be so quick to demand from God what we think we have to have or else we can't live. Because Christ is our life. And everything I don't get in this life because I have him, I get to enjoy it forever anyway. I don't have to make any payments on it in this life. You thought your family was messed up? Look at this verse. Jacob has buried Rachel, continues his journey in verse 21, and verse 22 says, It happened when Israel lived in that land that Reuben, that's one of his sons, went in and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard about it. And again, there's nothing after that sentence. Okay, my son just had a sexual relationship with someone that I've had a baby with. And I heard about it. My translation doesn't show any conversation, any action. Now later on, on his deathbed, he's going to say something to Reuben, to Simeon, and Levi. You know, sometimes we just wait too long to say what needs to be said. Sometimes we don't 
step into a situation with handling things biblically and we let them just fester. Then it eats us up and eats them up and just, he didn't say anything here. This would have been on the news. All right, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> the chapter closes with Isaac, verse 28, dying at 180 years old. And verse 29, he breathes his last, he dies, he was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Last point, Jacob and Esau came together to bury their father, but we have no record of them being together afterwards. Their descendants have continued to struggle to coexist to this very day. They had a measure of reconciliation, but there were seeds already sown in their descendants that to this day continue to be problematic in the Middle East and around the world. And you thought your family was messed up. Every family, every family. Not your in-laws, every family. <laughs> every family has some mess that they need to deal with. And every event, individual in every family stands in need of the amazing grace of God. I'm so glad we know a God who can clean up our mess and clean us up, can clean up that person that you've given up on. So glad I know a God who can help us to say and do what needs to be done. I'm so glad I know a God who can teach us to value everyone. Let's learn to treat people the way God wants us to treat them. I've asked Ronnie to play a song of reflection and meditation. I think a passage like this just begs us to respond in some way, shape, or form to what God has Spoken. I've asked Ronnie to play more than anything. Hopefully we'll begin to want Jesus Christ more than anything. If you're here today as the song plays, we invite you to come to the altar, do business with God, do business with God in your seat. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you need to stop straddling the fence. Maybe you need to speak to someone about a relationship that you know is out of God's will. Whatever it is, let's take a moment to do business with the Lord. Thank you.